What if Stephen Elliott, the director of The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, had made more movies? So, I'm, I'm a big fan of Stephen Elliott. I actually think he's Australia's answer to Billy Wilder. And, uh, you know, he comes at what I'd call the uh, kind of 90s period of Australian cinema's golden age, which... I'd say started around the 70s, went through the 80s, although the 80s could be really the golden age of the, uh, you know, the the miniseries, the long-form television or limited series. And um, he he came into prominence in the 90s, although throughout the 80s he was working on a lot of films. And um, I'd like to talk today about some of the films he might have made. And I'm also going to be drawing a little picture of him. Um, You can judge how successful it is. And, um, you know, it's sort of based on the idea that Billy Wilder had that famous picture of himself um, that adorned the box sets. I don't think mine's going to adorn any box sets, but uh, anyway, it's just a piece of fan art. And I want to show the dichotomy of his sort of more dramatic films, the more surreal films with the, you know, the more, the, the comedies. And um, and uh, it may come as a surprise, like, oh, you know, he's more famous for his comedies, like especially Priscilla, right? Because it's, a, you know, perpetual hit, right? It, became, it was a huge smash hit at Cannes, then in its theatrical run, it was a huge, um, you know, sold a lot of, you know, CDs back in the day. It was a hit single, and um, it even spawned a second CD. And then, obviously, it was a hit on VHS and DVD. And it, it even spawned a reality TV series. So, hey, you know, let anyway, let's dive into more of his work um, because he started as more of a surrealist because you've got frauds which was this sort of black comedy surrealist which was kind of being john malkovich before being john malkovich and of course then you've got the juggernaut that is priscilla which was followed up by my personal favorite welcome to whoop whoop which was a sort of john waters-esque kind of midnight madness type of film which debuted at Cannes and wasn't received all that well but does have a small but loyal cult following as I found out during my time of uh, hosting the unofficial fan website uh, which thanks to Linkrot and for me for deleting it um, doesn't really even exist it's only fragments on the Wayback Machine now and that's what a lot of today's uh, today's information is based off of. Um, so, and then from frauds he went, uh, sorry, went from um, Welcome to Whoop Whoop, he went on to Eye of the Beholder, which hit the top of the US box office and was a minor success and featured Ashley Judd and Ewan McGregor and Katie Lang and uh, Guinevere Baljol, and all, another personal favourite of mine. Then there was a big period where he's mainly working, um, doing script doctoring, and there were a lot of projects which could have got made but didn't, uh, which are some of the ones I want to talk about today. And then there was a big comeback with a trilogy of films, uh, first with, well, actually four, um, anyway, first with Easy Virtue, which was a big art house success. Then he came back with um, A Few Best Men, which was a big hit. And then, of course, you've got um, Swinging Safari, which is kind of like The Apartment, kind of like um, the film that Steven Spielberg just made. Um, is it The Fablemans? Um, basically, it's sort of a look back and a semi, semi, semi autobiographical film, and which is kind of quite reverential to his career. Um, and 
features some of the actors that he previously worked with, such as the wonderful um, Guy Pearce. Okay, let's get into it and let's take a look at my drawing. Okay, so now that I'm behind the scenes, so I'm going to try and do a kind of uh, Two-Face. Now I'm not calling Stephen Elliott Two-Faced, I'm just trying to show his, the dichotomy of the fact that he does the comedy and he does the tragedy. Like you've got um, Eye of the Beholder, which is, you know, quite a serious thriller. And then you've got like the big broad comedy of the Welcome to Whoop Whoop. And then you've got the surrealist of like Frauds and Beholder. And then, yeah. So it, it my illusion to him being like Billy Wilder is actually a lot more easy to understand if you actually look at the films that he might have made. So let's get to that. Um, now this is going based on my memory, um, so please forgive me. I was not 100% right when I originally wrote that fan site and it's been nearly 17 years since I deleted it. So, you know, please do forgive the fact that I won't remember much. Um, Anyway, so I'm going to look at some key films. Uh, first, I'd like to look at some potential comedies. Um, first up, there was Singing Margarita, which uh, potentially was going to have, um, I think it was Selma Hayek and um, uh, Antonio Banderas. And I don't remember much about the story, but there was a drag element in there. So... I think it could have been an awful lot of fun. I think that was with New Line Cinema and it's a real big shame that that never got made. It sounded like it could have been a lot of fun. Um, then we have Venetian Wedding, which was based on a true story. And I think this is something that Netflix could really pick up on because, you know, they really love those true stories about, you know, these women who get fooled by these con men. And this was a Sydney socialite who thought she was marrying a prince and she married a con man. And Stephen Elliott wrote the screenplay for it. Nothing ever came of it, but, you know, it was fun to imagine. Um, another one uh, of the comedies was... Um, now, this could have been a big one, um, which recently got made, was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Now, that was supposed to be for MTV, and I believe Marilyn Manson was supposed to be Frankenfurter, which perhaps we dodged a bullet there. And the concept, it was the exact same script, but it was sort of retooled to make it all about plastic surgery in the modern age. And I still think that would, have, would be fun. But, you know, we just had that um, reimagining um, the, the sort of Broadway live shows that uh, I think NBC is doing and that was with um, the wonderful Laverne Cox so you know it's definitely definitely something for today's audiences um, they're the comedies I remember oh, so they're okay again in the name of the dog um, which kind of is fun I think that was for Disney and um, but basically it's based on all those uh, different stories you hear of these very, very wealthy people and everything goes to the dog after they pass away and then all the shenanigans that happens after that. I think that could have been a lot of fun and again, I think Disney Plus should revive it. Um, another one would be uh, Remix, which was I think supposed to be a romantic comedy. Don't know much about that one. Another one was uh, Two Madams. Again, I don't know much about that one, but just from the title alone, um, same co-writer as Easy Virtue, I could have easily have seen this as being like Maggie Smith and uh, Angela Lansbury hamming it up and it would have been great. Um, another one... Uh, <laughs> Another one, ooh, 
racking my brains. Okay, there, there was this, um, I mean, this is sort of, was it a black comedy? Was it a gangster film? Um, but anyway, there was, there was this, you know, sort of long ingestation script that um, I think Stefan made a pass at and he moved, it was like a gangster film and he moved the action to England totally forgotten the name of the script but anyway that's kind of a an interesting thing there's a bit of gangster in there i don't know why i'm putting this in the comedy section but anyway there you go um also pinstripes on the prairies we've just had like five seasons of you know the green acres re revival that was uh uh schitt's creek um with dan levy and his father eugene levy and uh, Catherine, I've forgotten her name. Um, anyway, that and a little bit of Alexis. You know, uh, you know. Again, look. Uh, if I was Disney Plus, I would put straight in production, and it sounds like an awful lot of fun. Um, so I think they're the comedies. Um, miscellaneous one. I don't know really where it fits. Um, this is more of in the surrealist category. There was um, talk about. Stephen Elliott wanting to do Fellini's last script um, which was unfortunately bogged down in a lot of legal red tape and I do believe I read one of um, uh, uh, I read one of um, Rupert Everett's um, autobiographies now of course he is a bit of an unreliable narrator but in any case he does talk about meeting I think he talks about meeting Fellini just before he died for his last film project and so I kind of wonder is it the same project could they have actually have worked together um, you know this was also I think um, Stefan Elliott has mentioned that he wanted to use uh, Rupert Everett for the original cast of um, Priscilla which I think at that point was going to be Rupert Everett um, Jason Donovan and um, the guy from Faulty Towers, his name is escaping me right now. Um, <laughs> anyway, Basil, not Basil, the, the one in, anyway, that guy, that guy, you know who I'm talking about. Okay, so um, into the dramas, um, now there was a, there was a sort of, you know, thriller, that was supposed to star Courtney Love and Jeff Bridges and that sounded like it could have been another thing like um, uh, Eye of the Beholder it was definitely a step in that direction and um, it sounded like it could have been good just from the sound of it because I love a good thriller um, so then uh, another one of the dramas uh, Stephen Elliott seemed to have a bit of a, 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 a kind of Iron Rand period. Um, none of the films got made, unfortunately, but um, I think this was through Michael Douglas as the producer, and there was The Husband I Bought, um, which I read the short story of. Short story reads, reads just like a treatment for this great movie. It was the, it was for a script which was penned by, I think, Sotheby, uh, S Summerlee, anyway, the Richard Gere, Jodie Foster period drama. And um, I think it could have been really great. And uh, supposedly Ashley Judd and... Um, Ashley Judd and Charlize Theron were attached to do that. And um, it's a really pity, it's a big pity that that didn't get made, um, you know, Apparently, Stefan Elliott has talked about meeting with um, Hilary Swank um, right before 9-11, like on September the 10th at the World Trade Center. I mean, that's talk about, you know, bad timing for the movie, all the, the huge, huge tragedy that happened. Um, but that was supposed to be for a remake of The Fountainhead, um, which, you know, is a great Golden Age production. And... Uh, Think, yep, I think that, so it was just those two projects, um, but, you know, like, the because, I, because I've read the short story, 
I kind of feel like I've watched the movie, which is funny. It's a funny thing to say, but, you know, it, so, so in my head it's sort of one and more film in the drama category, but, you know, in actuality, you know, the, Stephen Elliott hasn't had the chance to make that many dramas, unfortunately, but I really think he could have been... Uh, I wish he'd gotten more chances to do it. Anyway, he's not dead, so, you know, he could, but... It's just that, you know, a film like Swinging Safari, where it's such a, a look back on your retrospective of your career, it sort of gives off the impression that, you know, maybe there's no more career to be had, he's sort of retiring. I don't know, I have no inside track, even though, well, anyway, I kind of do, but, you know, I have no interest in exploiting it for that, anyway. So... Look, um, so the other one, the big one that I want to talk about that I really, really think could have been, I mean, it, it, this is like the big one. I really wish this got made. Oh my goodness, I wish this got made. Anyway, it's the Susan Cabot story. Um, so I think I might have mentioned this when I, did, did I do a little short about watching, um, uh, her film, what Susan Cabot's film, um, The Wasp Woman, which actually was really great. Like, even though it's a Roger Corman film, it's a really good movie. It's just the kind of extra bits I got out of it wasn't very good. Anyway, um, you know, she, she had a son who was a little person and he ended up murdering her. And you know, it's it's so weird, but again, you know, I this feels more like a HBO project, but gosh, I wish this film got made. Um, this one was supposed to star... Um, oh, I'm going to give you the wrong name. Anyway, Phoebe from uh, Charmed, Rose McGowan. Rose McGowan, it was supposed to be the big star of that, and I believe... Vincent Perez, the um, that gorgeous French star, I believe he was attached to it at some point. I, I, I don't know if it's just in my head or I just dreamed it, but I kind of feel like um, uh, Guy Pearce was also attached to it somehow, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I, I feel like that this script was sort of like this sort of black comedy with musical elements, I'm not sure. Look, anyway, I'm talking out of my rear end at this point, but Black Oasis was the name of it, and I think it could have been incredible. And um, I think that brings me to the end of all the films I know about. Most of the films I know about come from that period when I was um, doing the website. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, I mean, it, you know, to, to talk about the experience, you know, may, maybe no one is cares all that much. They probably don't, but I guess it's something that was meaningful to me. Um, you know, it was... Obviously, I'm a big fan of Stephen Elliott. You know, I... Especially... You know, like... You know, it wasn't... Like, Priscilla, I was a fan of Priscilla, right? Um, but seeing Welcome to Whoop Whoop made me a fan of Stephen Elliott and then Over the Beholder just cemented it and um, as weird as Frauds was that also cemented was like wow like this guy is so talented and like I, I you know I, I sort of had a little desire to oh, obviously it was a big desire because obviously I've done it anyway like I wanted to be a filmmaker kind of but I didn't think I could do it you know I was just some stupid you know drag queen you know um graphic designer and I was going to do whatever right um but anyway I sort of followed his career thinking like oh you know if I ever got to be a filmmaker maybe I would be a filmmaker like him um, which I haven't been at all because I've ended up more sort of on the kind of Ang Lee, Douglas Sirk kind of filmmaker. Like, so um, there you go. Um, but I have tried to be, because I love Billy Wilder too, and I love Stephen Elliott, and I've, 
you know, I've tried to do the, you know, you know, I've done animation, I've done drama, I've done an action, I mean, you know, just shorts. I mean, my big thing is really melodrama, this sort of, I guess, Serkian type of um, film, kitchen sink drama. And, you know, I've, I've, I mean, I've tried my hand at everything, even including horror. Um, so, which is something Stefan Elliott has never done. Um, although there's horror elements uh, in Eye of the Beholder. Anyway, I'm my own person. But anyway, I, I got to go to Cannes. I got to bring American Piano to Cannes. So that was like a big moment because obviously I followed as a kid Stefan Elliott, you know, going to um, Cannes. Anyway, I'm just a stupid fan, aren't I? Okay, anyway, so, you know, because I was kind of following his career during university and I knew all this knowledge and I needed a way of practicing. And so, uh, you know, because I was studying graphic design and so I, um, I built a website and at first nobody really knew about it. And which was fine, you know, and, uh, but if I, because, you know, the internet, you know, the web point 1.0 was a different place than the place it is right now. Anyway, but, you know, I, I found all this information. I don't know how true it was, but anyway, I just put it all on there and, um, you know, and it, and it developed as I developed, you know, as I learned more about graphic design, I would update it and I would, you know, it was a, an excuse for me to, you know, obviously I had the passion for it, but also, you know, it was an excuse for me to learn how to do graphic design. So, like, when I learned HTML, I completely rejigged the website as HTML. Um, but, you know, when I came to Japan, I just didn't really have time for it anymore, and, and it was getting a bit weird, because, like, um, so... Uh, you know, on, on the positive side, like, some people in Stefan Elliott's camp were um, contacting me and giving me tidbits of information about upcoming projects, which was so, so special. And um, then one of his friends contacted me with pictures of a meatloaf he'd made, and that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then, you know, on the good side, back again, um, I was contacted by, you know, people who loved um, Welcome to Whoop Whoop just as much as I did, and it was, like, so gratifying to be like, what? It's not just me. Like, there are other people who love it, and we got to share, you know, the films that we loved, and um, also, yeah, there was a guy who also loved um, Eye of the Beholder, and he wrote a huge long essay, which, you know, again, I'm, I, I, which I put on the website. And, and that, anyway, I do regret it. I, I regret killing off the website. But, you know, I, you know, there was like someone who emailed me asking me if Stefan Elliott was Jewish. There were all these people who assumed that I was him, which was so weird. And, um... I think there was a guy who was trying to send me a script because they, he thought that I was him or could have got it to him somehow. And it was just, it just ended up being no fun anymore. It was just no, it was just, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm too much of a control freak, but I don't know. Like, it was never huge. Like, you know, the most hits we ever got was like 300 after... You know, if I if I got a tidbit of information, I would then send it through to um, as an anonymous tip, right, to um, uh, Dark Horizons, and he'd sometimes republish it, and so that would get me some hits that way. And then I think eventually it became this thing where we got about thirty hits a day, um, which I think was just like one person, and they'd read the whole website because you know you can track what people are doing, right? Um, anyway, it was a, it was a good experience overall, um, bit of a weird experience, but anyway, um, I, I've got to meet some really wonderful, wonderful people, um, I'm not saying their names because I don't know if they want to be associated with me or not, but, or, um, anyway, uh, but I hope maybe just listening to the kind of projects that he might have made um 
you know, obviously there are some of the reasons why they didn't get made was because he uh, was in a massive skiing accident. And, um, you know, other reasons is, I don't know. I don't know, because I'm, I'm just a stupid fan. So I don't know anything about anything. And I'm happy to be that way because, I don't know, fans are weird, right? <laughs> anyway, I just want to enjoy films, you know, like his segment in Rio, I Love You is really great. The film itself is terrible, but his segment is far, far the best and it's like one of the best things he's done. He's also done a, um, he's done all sorts of things. Um, but anyway, I just, I hope he does even though it sounds like he's kind of retired because um, of the the way Swinging Safari was, I hope he does make more films because he's so talented and I think his point of view is necessary in the world. Anyway, thank you so much for listening and I hope you don't mind that I've talked about a what I consider a golden age of Australian cinema writer and director. Thank you.